Doc, Dr. Ken Moore, he does a little bit of everything on OpenMDO. He's kind of somewhere in between like an application programmer and a framework developer. Uh, he's authored a large part of the standard library, written most of the solvers, uh, many of the drivers, and uh, quite a few of the components. He does a lot of the derivatives work for uh, like debugging tricky derivatives. He's really, really good at that. Um, luckily, we haven't had too many bugs in the derivative system in a while, but honestly, that's mostly thanks to Ken's hard work and getting rid of them when we find them. So he's going to demo the N2 viewer for you guys. Uh, there'll be another demonstration after this where we're going to talk about ways we think we can improve it. We're specifically looking for your feedback. But I've gotten some user feedback that like people find the N2 useful, but they didn't know about all the features in it. So we thought we'd just walk you guys through the basics of using the N2 as a starting point. All right. People will give me a model that I've never seen before and say, hey, there's something wrong with this. It's not converging, or the derivatives are wrong on there. See what you can do with it. And one of the tools that I fall back on to give me a good top-level view of what's going on is this N2 viewer. Um, you've also probably heard it called the N-squared viewer. I think in the past, we've called it the model viewer or view model. And they all mean the same thing, um, this, this N2 that we call it now. Um, so to start, just like Brett showed you here, we can access it through the command line. Um, we can also access it script-wise um, by importing it from OM, like anything else. So first thing I'm going to do here is just do the help again, so you can see what the options are for it. Um, we just give it a file name. So you, this will work on any model that you have. Um, I mean, as long as you don't have multiple problems in there, and as long as it sets up and runs the problem, this will run it, intercept, catch it before it runs, intercept, do the setup, and spit out a file. And the file is just an HTML file that you can share with other people. We don't have OpenMDO installed on their machines, and they can still use this viewer. The underlying technology is it's, it's HTML and JavaScript, and then we built it with uh, the D3 library, which is a nice data visualization library that's also written in JavaScript. So I've got a file here, um, circuit. And it actually comes from one of the examples. Um, it comes from this example, which was, um, oops, I don't look at that one yet. Um, that uh, it was about implicit, or it was about setting up balance components. So it's a simple circuit. And we actually removed, we actually removed the battery from it to make it even simpler for this test. Um, so yeah, we're solving for, basically for voltages and currents in this system. So what we've got is like a, we got a tableau here, and up top we got this little, this little bar that's full of buttons. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of these first. This Zo one right here looks like a signpost. Zoom in a bit, Ken. Um, I, I'm going to get to that. No, command plus. Oh, you mean the command, command plus? Font, yeah. uh, oh, I see what you mean, yeah. There you go. Well, is that good for everybody? OK. By the way, these buttons do have hover text. That's a show. That's also small. That's too big. OK. We turn that on, and then scroll down, you get a legend. So I'm going to talk about a lot of these things, but if you are ever using this or using it for the first time, and you forget what someone would do, you can always turn this legend on. But it makes more sense to keep it off. Um, the first thing I do when I load up a model, I never do Control Plus or Command Plus. Maybe I should. But instead, I, there's, there's, a, there's an interface here. There's a, there's a button called Model Height. And I play around with that to get it the exact size I want. Um, so this is a laptop, so yeah, that's about big enough. Um, obviously, we go much higher for like a large monitor. Then similarly, we can bump up the size of the text that's on there. So let's crank that all the way up, because we're in the big room here. OK. So down here, this is split into three zones. The left zone here is the, the hierarchy of your model. If you think of how it's usually top down, just kind of turn it on its side. So the very topmost prob.model model is on the left right here. Now, top model prob that model contains what looks like two components here, one called ground and one called source. Then it contains another group called circuit. So already you see that this color here is for components, this color here is for groups. If we go one level deeper, well, one level deeper on a, comp deeper on a component is, is the variable. 
And these two components here each contain just one output. So this is the color for output, B and I. You can see the full path of the output when I hover there, ground.v and source.i. That's it's generally a promoted path for outputs, and it's the absolute path for inputs, which is the normal OpenMDO convention anyway for specifying things. So inside of a circuit, we've got two resistors down here. We've got a diode. Oh, we've got the two computational nodes that sum the currents and make sure that to drive that to zero. Um, so that's, a, that's about as deep as we go, except we've got <coughs> variables on the sum of these. And there's some different colors here. Um, inputs are this color, this darker color. I, I can't tell you what color that is because it's different on my screen than on the up there. But outputs of that color, like I said earlier. Um, this funny color here, yellowish green, is implicit output. So we color those differently so you can see those. And the reason you want to be able to see those is so that you make sure that you put solvers at those levels. Um, and this here is kind of a little odd feature that we have called variable or variable trees, I think, um, separated by colon. So it's it's just a way of organizing inputs or outputs. So um, you may not see that in your models. So that's what we're done here. So I haven't talked about this color yet. And I'll just hold it. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about it in a second. The middle part here, this grid, is where we find out about our connections. I like imagine here along the diagonal, every square or circle here, squares for outputs, circles for inputs, is um, it's, it's a variable in the model. and. Uh, these are actually organized along here in execution order. So that, that's probably more relevant for the components, which are these boxes here. So here's the node component, node one component, which executes before the node two component, which executes before resistor one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, off the diagonal, we get outside these boxes. This is internal connections here. But external to a component, and I can actually click on these with the left mouse button to make them stay, these are the connections. So you got these connections here, and they are such that this is the execution order. So this component here will run, produce that output, and then by the time this component runs, that output's there ready for it to consume. Now, we've got some down here in the lower, the lower diagonal area as well. And these are variables that you, when, when this component runs, these variables aren't computed yet. So what that gives us is a kind of a, a feed forward or a cycle there. Um, so these are the variables you need a solver for. Um, let's go back to the red one here. So this red dot here um, corresponds to this red variable here. That's unconnected. There's nothing connected to it. Um, when debugging models, that's one of the that's one of the big things we look for because uh, if you've got a discipline code and somebody or if you've got a discipline to your modeling, somebody else is modeling discipline. The guy who's integrating them together has to make sure all his connections are, all the information is flowing from one to the other. But it's, it's, it's a challenge at times because you don't know some of the internals of these very complicated models. And it's easy to miss some connection to a variable that you, you, know, you just didn't really know about. So this is a graphical way, a visual way, of being able to look in here. And I don't know that this is wrong. For, in this particular case, um, we took out the battery. So basically, we're trying to drive this to a current. This, for this model, it's probably OK to do this. But in other cases, this could be this could be the reason why you know it's blown up or it's not working. So that's that for the middle. For the right-hand side section here, um, this is like a mirror image of what's over here on the left, and that's you know that's by design. This is the system hierarchy, but replaced the text in there is replaced with the solver. Um, what we got here is the the linear solver. So the top level here we got run once, which is default, just run through, um, basically chain rule. But for this level here, the, the, the circuit level, which is the one that contains all these cycles and these implicit variables as well, we've got a direct solver, which is a solver we want there. So that's good. Now, we also probably want to check and see what the nonlinear solvers are doing. And to do that, we click on this button here, which is a straight line, which I know that tells us what it does, right? So uh, finding, figuring out like good symbols to use for actions is a challenge. And we couldn't think of, think of one to switch between linear solver and nonlinear solver. So if anybody can think of one, I mean, we'd be eternally grateful. Because I think nobody is going to look at that and think that's going to do it. Let's push it. Let's push that button. Um, Uh-oh. There seems to be a problem here. Can anybody, anybody who, who isn't in our group know what the problem with this is? 
I'll tell you that run once is the default nonlinear solver, which runs everything once. That might give you a clue, actually. What's that? Yeah, that's right. So um, remember the audience stated that there's coupling there, so the run once solver is inappropriate for this. It's not going to work. And it's right. We, we need the Newton solver in there or Broyden or something in there that'll handle both the, um, these, these uh, cycles and the implicit variables as well. So, and by the way, you can clear all these, all these lines I put on the screen by pushing this eraser button if you want. So I've got one loaded up over here, and it shrunk again. Um, I'll do the Van Plessen and Justin suggested, where we replace that with Newton. And now it's fine. It's got Newton in there like it's supposed to. So OK, we're good. Um, let me show you some basic navigation. This model is nice and self-contained. But if you have a larger model, then you need to zoom in and zoom out and maybe close some things off. So we've got ways to do all that stuff. Left mouse button is what we use to zoom. So if I want to look at this circuit and nothing else. That zooms me in the circuit. I can look at a component, too. Let's look at, uh, let's look at N1. I click on that, and that, yeah, that fills the whole screen. We can go back. You go back by this blue bar over here is always parent system until you get to the top where it's the model. So if I click on that with the left mouse button, that takes me back. Now, there's a group of icons right here at the top, this group of four, that all go with the left mouse button. And uh, there's, this, there's a, an undo stack that's saved. So if I want to go back to where I was previously, which was zoomed in on N1, I can push the back button. I can also use this to always go up. So it takes me up one. And if I go back, it'll take me back down. If I go forward, it'll go back up. And I can go home with this one. So that's what those buttons do. I don't know how many people actually use these too much. I use home a fair amount, but I, I, I guess really, until, until I started to prepare for this talk, there's a lot of stuff I didn't do with this. So I've, I've learned from this as well. Um, the other thing you might want to do is to collapse something on here so it's not taking up so much space. So you look at the other stuff better. And that's what the right mouse button does now. So if I push the right mouse, right mouse button here on, well, I can push on. Let's close off the nodes. So I'll do that, and I'll do that. So now I can see resistor 1 and 2 and the diode better. And these, these components, the diagonals and the off-diagonal connections, have been, have been replaced with these highlighted block kind of uh, symbols here. Um, it's kind of an aggregate connection now. So this is like all the outputs. Some subset of the outputs is probably connected here, and some subset of the outputs is connected here. But it's just like turning that turning that component into a black box. Um, these four buttons up here pair up with the right mouse button. And it doesn't make sense for me to show them on here because we've only got a couple levels. So I'm going to open up the propulsor, which is another one that, that Brett mentioned. So I'll just do propulsor. OK, and that's a big one. Um, let me zoom in a little. I'll do the, nah, I'm going to have to do the fine tuning here. Um, maybe about 650. I don't go too deep because I still want to be able to see um, all the solvers over there. But you can see this is a lot deeper. I think it's about nine or ten levels deep. Um, Sorry, did you did you tell them this was the Pi cycle model? This is the propulsor model that Brett was talking about. Earlier. Yeah, this is the same one. So now you finally get to see this. And you know, it, it's it's you can't really see much at this level, but you can zoom in on things and we'll go into the, the flow station here. And uh, yeah, now now we can see that we can see connections here. So I can click on them, whatever. But some more about like some more specialized, yeah, it's hard to click, navigating. Let me go back to home, the left mouse button. So now I can use this slide down here. I can set a collapse depth. So if I set it to two, I'm just going to get one level, because that's not very good. There's like a, there's a, basically an in-depth R comp and, a, and one design group there. If I go to three, then I can look inside a design, and I can see that there's a, you know, the structure here. These are basically uh, elements of the, of the propulsion system that are connected up together. You know, we can we can go deeper, see more of it. Now, I'm going to set it back to 10, the default there, which is the maximum. 
So I could zoom in on fan here, and then one of these buttons up here, and I always have to look in my glasses. Collapse all, no, I want, uh, yeah, I want collapse all outputs in the view only. Let's try that. So that's gonna shrink this down. So basically I just have the components there. And then if I go back, well, okay, that one is still shrunk down like it was before, but the other ones are all, are all expanded. And if I had used the other button, let's see, if, let's, go to, let's go to inlet here. And if I use this one, um, collapse all outputs. And it should do it at all levels. So if I go back to home, everything's collapsed to, yeah, so that's basically the component level collapse, no variables anymore. And the way to restore that, you can use the uncollapse buttons here. So there's a corresponding uncollapse, uncollapse in view. I don't know how many people use these. I had never even touched those buttons before uh, preparing for this talk. So, and I've, and I've debugged a lot of models. Um, I mean, I can see the collapse step is the one that kind of stands out as being fairly useful, I think. Um, while I'm talking about that, there's this bar over here. Um, it's a filter but it filters on variables. So if you start typing in it, you get like, you're basically getting uh, full path names. But I think it's more useful, it, since, it, since wildcards work here, and this is the propulsion model, so let me, just, let me just look for gamma. Star gammas, there's 49 star gammas, 49 to match that pattern. So if I push search here, yeah, it, this actually prunes. It gets rid of anything in the view that that doesn't match that pattern. So if it, any component that doesn't have an input or an output with a star gamma, anything gamma in it, um, I can shrink it down further. I know there's like RPM in here, which is usually uh, n mech in some of our stuff, right? There's only three of those, so I can do that. And yeah, that's uh, a lot less. So the, the sum total of all the groups and their hierarchy and, and systems that contribute to any component that has an input or output with n mech in it. So the only way to reset that, because you start doing stuff over here, then you don't remember that you're in this view, and it can get really confusing because like things are missing. But you got to clear that out. Just delete that. Okay, and I'm back to normal here. Now we'll do one more exercise. Let's take, let's go to design, and just shrink it down a bit here. I think everybody knows the answer to this, but there's something wrong in this model right here. Does anybody know what it is? Just give you a moment to kind of look at it. And the hint is we've already mentioned what it is, but. Um, the she shaft, he the said shaft. the shaft should be before the fan. Yes, that's what it is. So his shaft down here, and it doesn't even have any inputs, and yet it's like, it's a feed forward connection here to here. This, so, it's, so it runs after this run. So like the first time that this uh, fan runs, it's going to be using like its, its local value and in the input, and it's not gonna get this value. And that's, if you don't have a, a, a solver in here, it's never gonna get that value. So, you know, they should be up here. Let's take a, a, a little closer look here. Um, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. I make that mistake a lot. So let me use the back button. What I wanted to do was right click on this. And you find out that that's actually not much. It's basically just an in depth bar comp. Um, so there was no reason not to move that up further. So that was a mistake. Um, if I click on fan, it's actually a little more complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on in fan. Um, so I have a little bit of time. So I want to show you something that's kind of cool. Um, you see in this, in the arguments here, there's one called use declare partial info. This one is, was an experimental feature. I think it was implemented back when we were having some performance problems on this, more so than now. So I think we wanted to keep it uh, as, a, as an option here so that it wasn't part of the, so it didn't, in, until we figured things out. And I think. Well, not, not all users declare any partial derivatives. So. Well, people yeah, who are doing gradient free stuff reason, may not, may not bother. It doesn't, it doesn't make the file any bigger. So but it, I don't no. think it slows things down. Maybe in generating it, but. Well, if you, 
Yeah, if you if you don't if you're not doing any derivatives whatsoever, you shouldn't use this feature. Yeah. But you'll see why in a second. Yeah. So, so let me. If you if you didn't, should I zoom in further? I guess you guys can see there. Instead of having like a big brick of you know full a full array of dots here, it's actually showing which derivatives are which which variable which outputs are functions of which inputs, and that comes from how you declare the partial like declare partial of some variable with respect to some other variables. So like here. R is only a function of n moles, and we declared a partial that just had R and n moles in it, and that's all it is here. So I don't think, we didn't use this much, um, so at least we haven't used this to actually debug real problems, but I think it could be useful. I think uh, having this in there is probably a powerful tool, but I guess time will tell. So um, that's all I've got. So any questions? <laughs> Now, just before we take questions uh, or comments, criticisms, uh, jeers, whatever, the next talk is going to be a proposal for two different ways that we can improve the API. So while we're happy to discuss ways that this could not be as uh, difficult to use, mm -hmm. um, just keep in mind the next talk is going to, so one of the challenges we've had with this is that every time we extend the API, we basically just add another button and it gets that much harder to use. Um, so we're happy to talk about better functionality but if you want to talk about a better way to design the UI, let's reserve those comments for after the next talk. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Well, that wasn't me, but it was uh, the team. <laughs> I've had the exact opposite comment from some other users who thought it was obtuse and hard to figure out. So yeah. they don't know how to use tooltips, I guess. But I think <laughs> different, different people work in different ways. So yeah. That's right. I Personally, I think this is usable, but the interface could be better. Um, I think that as it stands, if we didn't want to add any more functionality, I probably wouldn't mess with it. But I think there is some more functionality we'd like to add. So um, another comment I should make, because a couple of you mentioned that the performance of this thing doesn't work so well. I mean, Ken showed you some pretty big models, like that propulsor model, but that's a Pi cycle model that's actually like a really small Pi cycle model. Uh, and then in typical Eric fashion, he makes N2s where he'll stamp out 50 copies of that <laughs> and try to open it. Um, Tad is working on a refactor that should improve the performance, but I guarantee you guys are still going to make, every time we make it faster, you just make the model bigger yeah. till the point that the tools stop working, right? That's, by the way, this is. Yeah, induced demand, thank by you. By the way, this is the refactored code um, okay. of the early refactors. It, it, it actually fixed a couple of, Ted fixed a couple of bugs that have been there for a long time. Like the ex, ex, implicit variables used to show up before the inputs, and Ted fixed that. Oh, okay. So it's going to be, it's a pull request right now, so it's probably going to be on master within a couple of days. I think. So, so I think most of the people in the room do MDO in general. And so all of the people, so you're all familiar with this weird problem that we have where like we do all this work to get these results and then we have to do all this other work to figure out how to show those results, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like a big portion of our job is visualization. Um, ironically, the dev team here is starting to find ourselves in the same position where we've got at least a useful framework that's allowed you to build some pretty big, pretty complex models. And we're in the awkward position for people who know very little about proper UI design of having to design UI for these kind of visualization tools.